Welcome students. The title of the notes is Charlemagne, Uniting Germanic Kingdoms. Uh, this is the notes where uh, Europe is going to uh, become more unified. Uh, this is after the uh, time period of the Roman Empire. As a reminder, we are taking Cornell notes, uh, so make sure to put your notes on the right-hand side of the, the paper, and your big idea is after the notes on the left. Uh, this time period is the Middle Ages. Now the Middle Ages is from 500 to 1500, so around 1,000 year period. Uh, this is oftentimes called the Dark Ages in comparison to Rome and the Renaissance. So Rome had a very um, uh, lively time period, a very uh, golden time period when there was a lot of inventions and a lot of art and a lot of culture, a lot of uh, poetry, uh, also with the Renaissance. But for a thousand years, there will be a dark time period where it's very disunified and a lot of problems uh, going on uh, socially that cause uh, no um, culture to be developed. Uh, the cause of this uh, Dark Ages, this Middle Ages time period, is the Germanic invasions of Western Europe. <clears throat> uh, this is going to disrupt trade and the government. People are going to abandon cities. Uh, learning is going to decline. Uh, the uh, use of Greek is almost going to be completely lost during this time period. Uh, the loss of common language uh, as well. Uh, the introduction of German language uh, changes Latin, uh, and there's going to be a lot of different dialects that evolve. So during this time period, you have less unification. You have a lot more uh, clans, a lot more barbarians, a lot disunification. So you're going to have a lot of different dialects that are going to develop. So no longer is Greek or Latin uh, going to be the, the, the language during the time period, um, but people are going to be speaking uh, different dialects of German uh, during this time period. Uh, Clovis, he's going to rule the Franks. Now, don't mix up the term Franks with French, uh, though the term France and French is going to come from the Franks. The Franks are actually German people. So these Germanic people are called Franks and hold the power uh, in what is known as the Roman province of Gaul. You don't need to write that down. Uh, Clovis, he's going to be the leader of the Franks, and he converts to Christianity in 496. That will become important because uh, the church is going to uh, help him out with his victories. So uh, these Germanic people, the Franks, he's going to... Um, lead them and he's going to uh, rule over them. Uh, so he's really the, the start of more of a unified Europe uh, during this time period. So he's going to be aided by the church after his conversion to Christianity. Uh, the church supports military campaigns against the Germans, so uh, he's going to conquer the Germans and unify the Germans uh, through the church's help. Uh, he unites the Franks into uh, one group in 511. Uh, so uh, the Franks, remember this is the German people, the Franks, uh, they're going to be unified into one group through uh, Clovis and the church. The church is going to send out missionaries to convert many Romans, or not Romans, but Germans. Uh, the Germans and uh, also Celtic people in uh, what is today Britain are going to be converted uh, by the church during this time period. And when we say church, we're talking about the Roman Catholic Church in Rome, uh, where they preside at the time. Uh, the Germans are going to adopt Christianity. Pope Gregory brings unity during this time period. So the spreads of uh, churchly kingdom uh, to include secular affairs. So no longer is the church just going to be concerned with uh, spiritual affairs and church affairs, but the church is going to now be involved in uh, society, involved in politics. Uh, we see this uh, throughout American history to a certain degree, but during this time period, the church is heavily involved in secular affairs. Uh, the church is going to use money to raise armies, to care for the poor, 
and to negotiate treaties. So as you see right here, the church is going to become very uh, political and very uh, powerful. Um, and as you can see right here and analyze, there will be some problems with that as the church uh, is involved politically, uh, that, that tendency to become politically corrupt uh, will be a challenge and uh, unfortunately will happen through much of the church age during this time period, which again uh, brings note to this dark ages. Uh, monasteries, you need to know the uh, what a monastery is. A monastery is um, a place where monks live, built by the church. Uh, the monks study and serve God there. Uh, the famous monk Benedict, uh, he writes rules to govern monastic life. So this whole monk uh, culture will be created under uh, Monk Benedict's uh, rules. So uh, the monks are not just reading the Bible and not just studying the Bible, but they're also studying uh, Benedict's uh, different uh, rules to govern monastic life. Monastic life in the monasteries for the monks. Uh, and the monks, uh, of course, are celibate. So it's all men. It's just men in these monasteries that are um, monks. Uh, the women, on the other hand, are going to be living in convents, and these are where nuns live to serve God. So if you feel like you are a woman that wants to completely serve God for the rest of your life, you are going to become a nun, which renounces your um, opportunities to marriage uh, and your life, and so you go and live in a convent. Just like the monks, uh, those are men that are going to um, give up their uh, life in order to live, um, to study for God. Uh, Scholastica uh, adopts the rules for nuns, and this is believed to be the twin sister of Benedict. You don't need to write that down, they italicized. Uh, the manuscripts. Manuscripts are uh, written documents uh, by hand instead of print printed. And so the monks are going to establish schools and preserve learning through the libraries. Uh, they're going to uh, really be the only ones that are preserving the culture of Rome and of Greece using the Latin and the Greek. So even though this time period is the Dark Ages, uh, the church is going to be preserving the culture uh, for a thousand years until the Renaissance and that rebirth. So uh, one could argue that this time period is not totally dark because the monks uh, through the church are preserving much of the um, culture from the past, especially through the manuscripts. Uh, the Frankish Empire evolves, uh, this Frankish Empire being, of course, German. Uh, Charles Martel is going to emerge. Uh, he's also known as Charles the Hammer. As you can see with the picture right here, he's wielding a hammer. Um, so he'd be known as Charles the Hammer. Charles Martel, he becomes uh, more powerful than any king. Uh, he's going to fight in the Battle of Tours. Uh, he defeats the Muslims uh, from Spain in 732. So the Muslims are going to be encroaching throughout North Africa, then up through Spain, and he's going to beat them back uh, in Tours, France. So this is a uh, German man. Um, Germany and France being uh, countries neighbors to each other. Uh, the, the Spanish uh, Muslims are going to try to uh, conquer that territory, and he's able to defeat them. Uh, he becomes a Christian hero by keeping uh, France free from Islam. As you can see right here, the map uh, of the Muslim expansion, uh, and there on the top uh, left-hand side, you can see from Spain up into uh, France, Germany, uh, they were trying to encroach. So he becomes a Christian hero, keeping France free uh, from the Muslim uh, expansion there. So he's known as a, a Christian hero and a hero, um, and is going to start this Frankish empire as a result. Again, Charles the Hammer. Uh, the Frankish empire evolves. Uh, his son, Pepin the Short, uh, he is going to defeat the Lombards. Now, you don't need to know this or write this down, but the Lombards were the uh, German barbarians controlling Rome at the time. Uh, so he's anointed by the Pope and establishes an alliance between the Pope and the Frankish kings. So <clears throat> the, the Pope, uh, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church in Rome, 
uh, they are uh, the the territory is controlled by these uh, Germanic Lombards, and so Pepin the Short uh, he is able to free uh, the Pope and free Rome from these menacing Lombards, and so he's crowned um, uh, as king, and he is um, anointed by the Pope. Uh, this creates a powerful dynasty, the Carolingian dynasty, um, that would last for several years. Um, so this Carolingian dynasty will become kind of the first of the united uh, dynasties. Uh, he's going to, uh, the Carolingians are going to rule for around 200 years. Uh, then you have Charlemagne. Charlemagne is the second son to Pepin the Short. Charlemagne's older brother dies, and so Charlemagne, the younger brother, uh, ends up uh, becoming king. Uh, he reunites Western Europe and spreads Christianity. Uh, in 800, he protects Pope Leo III from mobs in Rome. Uh, in response to that, out of thanks and gratitude, the Pope crowns Charlemagne emperor. So uh, Charlemagne uh, he is going to continue this, <clears throat> this uh, um, protection of Rome and protection of the Roman Catholic Church. And so in response, the Catholic Church is giving him uh, power, uh, gives him the title Roman Emperor. Uh, these three underlined right here are very important because uh, this is the first time that the Germanic power, the church and the heritage of the Roman Empire from the past is now joined together. So this time period is known as the Holy Roman Empire, which is actually kind of comical because uh, it is not holy because the church is uh, becoming corrupted at this time. Uh, it is not uh, Roman uh, because Rome was in Italy, not in uh, um, Germany as uh, Charlemagne is, and it's not really an empire. Um, but the Holy Roman Empire is the time period that this is called, and this is what Charlemagne um, becomes emperor over. So the Germanic people, the church, and the Roman Empire are now all joined together. Uh, what's interesting about this is that Adolf Hitler will create what is called the Third Reich. Uh, it's called the Third Reich because uh, this time period is known as the First Reich, or First Rule. Uh, just before World War I, that would be the Second Reich in German history. And the Third Reich in German history would be the Nazi Empire under Charlemagne's revival. Charlemagne limits nobles' uh, power. The way that he does this is that he sends out agents to ensure counts rule justly. Uh, he's going to visit every part of his empire, and he's going to supervise the management. So really, Charlemagne is the ideal emperor. Uh, he's known as a very good emperor in that he really cares about his empire and he really wants to make sure that it's ruled correctly. Um, he teaches himself how to read, He really, which was uh, unique back then for kings to read. Usually only the monks read. Uh, but he teaches himself to read. He's really involved in government and he really wants to study and become a good king. And he would be known as a good king throughout history. Uh, so he's going to send out people to make sure that everything's run correctly. He's going to visit and supervise everything. And then um, he's going to make sure the management is supervised as well. He encourages learning and orders uh, monasteries uh, to open schools. Uh, so again, he's somebody that wants to do a lot of good for his people and to ensure that rule is done correctly. Uh, as you can see right here, this would be Charlemagne's empire. As you can see, all of France, Germany, uh, close to Russia, down into uh, Rome, uh, that would be his, uh, his empire in 800. Um, there would be portions of Rome and of Italy that would be church property uh, under the church, but Charlemagne controls most of this area. So that's the end of the notes. Make sure to review and to summarize. Uh, be prepared with a one-sentence summary to share in class. And thank you for taking these notes.